So we're letting Mirabelle see herself, a virtual self, that we can transform. Okay. So we can transform it in its posture, how relaxed it is. You can see Mirabelle sitting up. We could make it so that the legs are sticking out. Um, we can transform it in its gender, in how big it is. And here at the Max Planck, we do a lot of that. So we study what it would be like to have a larger BMI or a smaller BMI. So how do you experience the world if all of a sudden you look down and you've lost a few kilograms or pounds, right? Stones, whatever you measure them in. We can use virtual reality to make people see what it's like to be a different person. But we can also do things that are really impossible. So a lot of times what we do here is we transform the hand so that the hand is just a lot bigger. And then we can understand the relationship between your own body size and the way you perceive the world around you. But what Mirabelle is experiencing is we're letting her look at herself in the face, right? So she can actually use this as a hand mirror, this tracked object, and look and see what her face looks like. And that's really awesome because though headsets today are really impressive, they have a little bit of a low field of view. So if you look at a, a girl in a mirror that's you know, out to the distance that the mirror is here, then you don't see the face so well. But here, she can bring the mirror right up to her face, and she sees a really nice resolution face. And this avatar that she's seeing here is the average female from a database of a large number of humans that have been body scanned. They've done that here in Germany, as well as at the Brown University. And they've taken really tens of thousands of people and done a 3D body scan. Um, and then they do amazing research where they um, can actually put them all into a registered scan. So if they scanned me and you, they would be able to understand exactly the shape difference that turns me into you, right? How to morph me into you. And exactly what makes a person look male and what makes them look female. And is that, is that all data then effectively? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really impressive large-scale data actually. So they do a lot of research with that. What we benefit from, from that work is that we can actually manipulate the way people look. So we have research right now, which is what I said before, where we can take advantage of that database and really plausibly make me fatter. So not just make me have more fat, but actually model mathematically what I would look like if I gained a certain amount of BMI, which is really awesome uh, research. So unfortunately, we can't change the BMI of her, but we can change her to a male. Many people that demo in our lab, we ask them, do you want to be a male or a female? And so many of them say the opposite gender that they are, because obviously in the real world, you can't so quickly and easily and what's cool about what she's seeing is, and capability that we have is that we can do all this motion tracking, right? Joachim talked about that. Right now, we're just using inverse kinematics so that she can really see her avatar's hand move as, as her hand moves. And research really shows that's called visual motor synchrony. It shows that when you can actually see your body moving um, visually as it is physically, that you have a really strong experience of that being your body, right? Even if it looks different than you. In this case, it's a male. If it was a very large person or the skin color was different, people still take ownership over it. And it's a fascinating tool then because you can really research, as our collaborator Mel Slater has done a lot of, how people's attitudes change when they become a different race or a different gender. What we do as well is we put people into a full body motion capture suit, and then they can really walk around freely, move, and they see that avatar move as they do. So we've really, in the past, had a lot of people have a rejection of that and say, that's not me. Yeah. But it, it comes yeah. out of an experience of, wait, what if that was me? Right? And they want to express, but wait a minute, that's not, that's not who I am, that's not perfectly me. And it's yeah. very often when they look at the face. Yeah. So especially what I was talking about before, they see their body, they, it's moving, yeah. and they think, oh, that's me. And then when we give a large mirror and they look, they say, but wait, that's not me. Yeah. Yeah. So there is sort of a, a, an idea that this is you in the virtual world. You know, you don't always want to be you. When you're on the airplane and you're a six foot guy, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be a super tall guy in an airplane, so maybe you want to become really small. Yeah, or if yeah. you're older and you're tired and you just want to remember what it was like to be young, yeah. and someone can offer you that experience, say, hey, here's the younger you. Yeah, yeah. That's what this technology could enable people to have. Yeah. And why not let the airplanes give it to us, right? When you're flying and you're exhausted, why not have a rejuvenating experience of what it's like to be young or smaller, you know, how, how often someone who's big probably looks at me and says, oh man, I wish I had her short legs, right, when they're in the airplane. Yeah. Um, and that's the only time I'm happy to have my short legs. <laughs> but still, it's really um, powerful what you can give people. Yeah, and that's something we really, it's important for us here, is really to build into the environment. The person can really say, hey, I want to be this person, or I want to be in this environment. And they get to say, they want to be in the mountains, they want to be at the sea, they want to be in a bigger space. Yeah. 
I mean, some people are afraid of flying, and so they might not like to be in a bigger space. They might certainly not like to be in the clouds, yeah, right? Yeah. So maybe what they'd like to do is be back in their room in a small, confined space that is calming. Yeah. And so you can't really make the assumption that everybody wants this big open space when they're in an airplane. Maybe they want it to be cozy and maybe without all the other people. Do you have many people who feel nauseous or anything? Yeah, so we're really mostly lucky. In fact, that's exactly what we're studying. The experiment that's running right now with the cyber motion simulator is exactly asking whether or not and to what degree people get sick. And what we've had in the past is typically if you have people walking in this room, the most time people have gotten sick is when they're walking in this room and our scientists are mismapping the way they're walking. So they walk forward and the, ro the world is spinning around them, right? So because this motion sickness mostly comes from a mismapping or um, if we're trying to do it perfectly, it comes from the fact that you can accelerate your head really fast and then the tracking has a very challenging job of making that work perfectly, right? So um, this is where I think most people get sick. We have the luxury that we, if anybody says they're feeling sick or they look a little pale, we just stop the experience, right? Um, but for VR hyperspace, we really want to see how long people can experience it and enjoy it, right? So I'm a lucky person, I don't get that sick. But still the question arises, could I be in a head-mounted display for two hours or three hours, right? Um, and what would be the consequences, right, to my physical health, not just motion sickness? And our partners, again, at Barcelona are looking into that because obviously you'd want to be moving a little bit, right? Because if you're just sitting there, even watching a movie, you start to feel a little sick, right? So we're trying to integrate some tools in to get people moving and to make sure we have an awareness of their sickness. And another thing that we're doing there is measuring their heart rate and measuring how much they're sweating because these things might give us an indicator even before you knew that you started to feel sick. Hey, let's back off the experience or have him start moving more slowly because that might prevent motion sickness. So the work from Barcelona, um, our colleague Elena Coconera, she does some really amazing work where the idea is, is that you could maybe move really a lot in the virtual world, but only in, in reality moving like this, right? So that you could still move in your seat, but you experience your virtual self as really moving like Superman, right? Moving really fast through the space. Um, and that really works. If you move just a small amount and you see that hand reaching really far, or if you move your legs just a little bit and you're walking through the space, people like that. That's a natural interface, right? And so that's something that's important to us because we don't want people to use VR and then ultimately be in more pain. We want more comfort overall. So it's been a real challenge, but really interesting to see what you can do in terms of changing people's environments to increase their comfort.